Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. My name is Rüstem Ertuğ Altınay. I'm a visiting scholar in the Faculty of Communications at Kadir Has University and the principal investigator of the project, Staging National Abjection, Theater and Politics in Turkey and its Diasporas. The Performance and Politics webinar series and our broader project is funded by a European Research Council starting grant. We are grateful to the European Commission and our host institution, Kadir Has University, for their generous support. Tonight, we are very happy to host Oliver Ayokic and Kristina Novakovici, and our moderator will be Riyad Kadantash. Riyad is a student in the PhD program in Communication Studies at Kadir Has University. Her primary area of research is Alevi theater in Turkey and its European diasporas. Riyad, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome to the seventh week of our Kadir Has ARC Performance and Politics webinar series. Uh, my name is Rhea Kalintash, and I'm a researcher here at the ERC-funded project, Staging National Objection, Theater and Politics in Turkey and its Diasporas. Um, first of all, I would like to thank our kind host, Kadir Has University and the European Research Council for their generous support. Um, it is an honor to be the moderator uh, for this week's presentation, which will be a bit different um, than the other weeks. Uh, because this week uh, our webinar will be a workshop actually, and we have two uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Olivera Jokic and Kristina Novakov Richley. Um, let me give you the flow of the workshop first. Uh, the title of the workshop is What a Peasant Could Know on the Path and Performance of Modernity in the Context of Post Socialist Ex Yugoslavia. Uh, first, Dr. Jokic will make her presentation with a focus on the significance of biographies of three women born, uh, born uh, to peasant families in the area in the 1910s. Uh, then Christina Novakov richly uh, will uh, make her presentation titled Peasant Epistemologies and Folklore in the Yugoslav Region, which focuses on the progressive repudiation of peasant ways of knowing um, till today as a part of an ongoing program of colonially informed epistemic violence. Now I have to change the slide, yes. Um, before we start, I would like to remind you all that if you would like to be notified of our future events, you can follow us from um, Staging National Objection on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. <laughs> Just a second. And um, I'm sorry. Uh, you can also uh, leave your email addresses to the chat box then uh, for our future announcements, then we can um, collect them and let you know. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers, Dr. Olivera Jokic and Kristina Novakovic first. Um, Dr. Jokic is an associate professor of literature and gender studies at John, uh, John Jay College of the uh, CUNY, City University of New York. She is interested in the relationships between literary writing and historical documentation especially the archives of colonialism uh, in the constitution of archives in writing about gender and histories of women's writing. Uh, and she's a co-editor with Dr. Altenay of two recent journals, special issues about relationships between archives and popular culture. Uh, Kristina Novakov richly is a PhD candidate in the culture and performance at the University of California, Los Angeles. And her research focuses on peasants, feminism, ecology, folklore, and aesthetics in the Yugos, uh, Yugoslav region. Her next research project is a monograph on global post-socialist video and performance art. Um, she's the co-organizer of the Post-Socialist Studies Group funded by the University of California Humanities Research Institute and a core member of the Dialoguing Post Network. Dr. Jokic and Christian Anomoko Richley, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ria, and thanks everybody else for hosting us. Um, do I go first? Is that the plan? Yes, whatever yeah. you like. <laughs> okay. So thanks everybody for showing up and um, thanks Christina for agreeing to share the floor. Um, and um, as Ruiz just explained or announced, um, I'm speaking today about the 
significance of biographies of three women born to peasant families in the 1910s in the region that was for a while Yugoslavia. We were just saying before the meeting started how everything is in uh, brackets. Um, so I'll explain in a minute um, what the region is and um, why the geography matters. Um, and we'll look at some pictures in the in towards the end of my presentation. Uh, but um, I'm speaking both about the biographies and about the significance of biographical approach um, to the study of gender and to the study of gender as a performative um, kind of um, category. Um, so um, I have a relatively short presentation and um, then I'm going to um, share a few pictures with you so we can um, think about how this stuff works. Um, all these women, all three women that I'm speaking about lived their early adult lives in the same small town in present day Serbia following World War II. The coincidence of their being in the same town at the same time has to do with the historical moment. Two were born there and one was moved there by the socialist state established in the aftermath of World War II. So they lined up generationally and geographically in that town uh, that is in the north of what is today Serbia. One of the locals moved to the city out of the village and two others stayed in that small town or the village, if you will, if a village is the sort of place where you traditionally find peasants. They were children, all, of, all three of them, of peasants, married to peasants, that is to people who may have owned some land, who definitely worked on it, and therefore were not expected to move very far from the land, that is from the village. I say that biographies are interesting here in the sense that it is interesting now to look at the kinds of narratives we can tell about the women being who they were, how to be in ordinary and provincial. They could be some of the star subjects of social and cultural history of the past 50 years, the history that has been interested in the lives of peasants, often medieval ones, and in the lives of women. Women figure both as the structurally neglected subjects of political historiography and as a methodological challenge when it comes to the availability of historical materials with which to say something about their lives. Biographies are, are then interesting as a matter of archives or archival materials, the kind of stuff these women left behind that can be read. These were women with little, if any, formal education who barely read sorry, and almost never wrote, except in their recipe books or occasional notes. One of them was illiterate and attended literacy courses in adult education and quote unquote national defense run under the auspices of the state supported women's organization that was in place um, after World War II and had offices in very um, many towns, even the small ones. We do have some photographs of them and we will look at some of those in a minute. So we can see a bit of how they looked, but really look at their relationship to that technology and what we can make of its availability and their use of the technology and their relationship to it in ways that availability of photographs and their style suggest something about how their lives unfolded. Biographies and autobiographies of women were mainstream feminist projects of the 70s and 1970s and 1980s, especially in the Anglophone that is British and North American feminism. And here we are looking to those to note how they are embedded in a particular idea or phase of feminism, which inspired, aspired to write women into history and political discourse by um, giving them a voice or presuming that they are taking on a woman's perspective, often to extol women's achievements, they're deserving of attention. Here, however, we're looking at the sorts of people whose adventures were not of particular interest to historians of states, nations, and empires, even after the disintegration of the socialist states um, in which they lived and whose life narratives could have some contact points with the life narratives of working class women who were added to the canon of feminism in the late 20th century. 
Carolyn Steedman, in my opinion, is probably the most interesting feminist writer historian who has been addressing both the absence of working class women from histories of the working class, that is of most people alive, and of the methodological difficulties such historiography presents. Autobiographically and biographically, um, Steedman wrote this um, uh, amazing book called uh, Landscape for a Good Woman, A Story of Two Lives. That's a biography of her mother and her own autobiography. Um, super interesting writing and thinking. Um, in, it's about the post-World War II moment in Britain in which social policies created new ideas about womanhood and motherhood. And um, Stephen talks about how that kind of socialist moment um, shaped the lives of women in Britain uh, in unforgettable um, and um, unerasable ways. The working class autobiography in English was a call to a kind of intersectionality in the treatment of women's lives, that it's an appeal to abandon the essentialism of gender categories that informed the mainstream feminism of its day. It's worth returning to biographies now, I would argue, because there's something interesting about the idea of gender categories in these narratives of the three women that can serve only as a loose guide rail for writing. The unorthodox archival store gets us away from existing frame narratives for histories of gender in ex-Yugoslavia or Central and Eastern Europe or in the post-socialist countries of Eastern and Central Europe, in particular because these women fall outside of ideas of womanhood serviceable to liberal feminism. They instead took on quite seriously, not to say consciously, the new options for performing femininity that they found available in front of them. This means, for one, that they made use of the radical new social policies proffered by early socialist Yugoslavia and adopted in, a lar in the larger context a push for modernization and urbanization of the new society. This kind of move guaranteed, among other novelties, equal rights and privileges to women, from the right to vote to open access to education and property ownership. At the same time, these women were far removed from the central theaters of social change and modernization that would be cities and institutions. They were too old, too poor, too provincial to become new women. Um, this is sort of the guiding light of um, women in post-war Europe. In the urban um, Western Europe after the war, but these women still made use of the new possibilities available to women in ways that historiographies of gender about the region and beyond have barely mentioned. Two of the three were widows of local partisans killed in battle and found themselves the new rightful heads of rural households, owners of homes and land, and single mothers of children who qualified under certain conditions for state scholarships. They could go to college for free and get some funding um, to pay for living expenses in the cities where the universities were. One had been moved with her husband and children to the town by the socialist state from a different part of the new nation, namely from Montenegro, which is now a separate state, to Serbia, uh, deliberately displaced to where they would own property and land and send their children to school regardless of gender and economic wealth. This was vastly different from the um, practically feudal circumstances um, of their childhood. Newly entitled to dispose of their property and to use their children's education for social and geographic mobility, these women contributed to the network of an intense migration in the mid 20th century Yugoslavia that shapes the politics of gender and urbanization in the region to this day, down to neo-traditionalist demands for a return to normal, quote unquote, after alleged years of socialist deviance that would be polarize gender categories so they better fit a free market society. Registering historical change and appeals to available models for gendered action, the life narratives of these women can help us to see how conceptions of gender could be or have been remade from the materials at hand against the backdrop of abstractions of state mandated modernization and beyond the disappearance of the state itself and its commitment to socialism or emancipation. The women themselves never committed to any categories by which we have often made sense of women's history or recovered female subjects, never explicitly went out for women's rights or emancipation, never were dedicated activists joining movements propelled by some clear political consciousness. Um, this sort of in the context of 
um, existing literature about the region and the recovery of quote unquote feminism among women um, who were um, alive um, when the second and other waves were happening in Britain and North America. Because of their circumstances, the near feudal environment of the village, the widowhood, the xenophobia, they operated on a range of frequencies that are difficult to reconcile with any kind of available political alignment. They're definitely at odds with the priorities of feminist historiography or histories of women, the assumptions about the delays in women's achievements in Central and Eastern Europe, and then efforts to demonstrate that there were achievements or how they, they were prominent women who did not suffer from false consciousness. The three women's materials suggest the possibility of alternative focal points for understanding the 20th century in Central and Eastern Europe, all in scare quotes. Such a take is concerned not with socialism or nationalism as totalizing circumstances or with historical subjects as either their victims or partisans. Their biographies need not owe much to historical narratives about feminism or glorifying accounts of women's emancipation, even against the backdrop of social policy that made it made it its business to address systemically the position of women in socialist Yugoslavia, or against the strain of feminist historiography, historiography prevalent in the global north that reckons women's empowerment as a measure of access to goods and capital. The women's biographies are constructs contingent on the materials available, gender scripts and documents at hand, as well as their human contacts, their offspring, and those who remember them. They make room for narratives about specifically gender subjects thoroughly shaped by the changing political, social, and institutional conditions of their lives. We've never heard much about what they made of those circumstances, possibly because we have not had a historical or academic lens trained on the region whose scale or size or profile could make us interested in them. So I offer here some pictures and stories as a potential beginning of a very interesting material history or materialist history of gender and of the unforeseen conditions these women interpreted as their own. Accessible primarily through personal connections, private memorials and oral histories collected along the way, these materials offer alternatives to state sponsored archives and their preferences for specific versions and origins of documentary authority wondering about the significance of literacy and written documentation, as well as access to technologies of recordation, such as photography, and the kinds of affect associated with its glamour and expense. The pictures of women and the moves they made or found imaginable might tell us something about how else to account for significance of the redoing of gender and about the uses and claims about its rigidity and persistence. So um, I'm going to um share my screen so that we could look at some of these pictures that um i would like you to consider uh, everybody can see it cool so um these are the borders of socialist yugoslavia um, the shape of this Yugoslavia, this is the one that came into existence in 1945 following World War II um, and disintegrated or started to disintegrate in the early 1990s, <coughs> is different from um, the one that preceded it, the state before the beginning of World War II uh, was um, also called Yugoslavia. Uh, but had different borders. Um, I am going to, uh -huh, here. Um, so we're looking at um, the kind of um, administrative span of the state in which these women were adults, uh, but not necessarily the state um, of which in which they were children. Um, those who were born before 1918, uh, because they were born in the north of Serbia, were actually born subjects to the Habsburg Empire. Um, this is where the town is, where the little red square, uh, what red circle sits. Um, so this is um, 
the area on the border with uh, closest the borders are with Hungary and now Croatia. And this is one of these women, uh, born 1915. Um, date of birth is unclear. Um, she was born in a peasant family and one of seven children. Um, and because she was in a family that was literally making um, it hard to feed all the children, she was sent to be trained um, to be a house servant and a cook in the family of the local uh, German landholders. There's a um, word in the um, local language in what would have been Serbocration or any number of names these days. Um, that's uh, something like uh, a word for education, but it's not used anymore. And the first and only time I've ever heard of it was when I was hearing about uh, this woman's life. Um, because she was so poor, we have no photographs of her. She was not even imagining that she could have pictures of herself taken as a child. Um, what is interesting is that um, we get some later pictures um, of her as a young woman. This is another one. Um, these two are both from the village, um, born and raised there. And this is the third one. Um, of this one, we have no official portraits except the ones that were taken for um, the identification documents. She is um, one of the migrants who moved um, in large groups um, in the late 1940s from Montenegro into the village and um, ended up um, occupying or living in the houses that were left there by the Germans who were um, sort of old settlers of the town who um, fled um, once the war was over, um, mostly in fear of retribution from the Russian army that was advancing. Um, so that portrait of the second woman, Vuka, is um, taken from this one. Um, I used to think that there was something wrong with the paper that the paper had molded and had been cut. But what happened here was that she herself had cut a friend of hers out of the picture. They, the three of them went to a photo studio and had their picture taken. But that woman, that friend, who happened to be the sister of her future husband, um, turned against her uh, once her husband was dead and she was sort of living her new life um, in socialist Yugoslavia once she started having relationships with other men um, as a punishment for uh, that betrayal. Avuka cut her former friend and sister-in-law out of her um, memorials. This is the back. Uh, where we get to hear a little bit about what this might have been about. Um, the uh, capital M is um, the first letter of the name of Milena. That's the friend who's been cut out. Um, you get to see what Luca's handwriting was like. This is Luca's wedding photo. There is one. And these are her kids in the um, late 1940s. Rada doesn't have a wedding picture, but has one with her children. I thought the look in her eyes is quite telling. And this is the husband. So both Vuka and Rada are the widows and the husbands um, were killed uh, fighting on the side of what was uh, perceived to be the communist sort of army, the, the army of liberators and the army that uh, won the war. Um, he, her husband was killed and is now appearing um, in one of the monographs about the small town um, as one of the sort of he heroes of 
uh, resistance and anti-fascist fight. On the side of Rada's narratives about her own experience, um, she had told her granddaughter that she was kind of glad that he was killed because if they hadn't killed him, she might have had to. This is because he was actually an alcoholic and she had tried to leave him before the war, but had nowhere to go and was too poor to do anything. So his death was a kind of liberation for her. And with the new um, um, real estate that she had um, and her perception that the village had no uh, prospects for her or her children, uh, she sold the house and uh, moved to the nearest city, Novi Sad. Um, the rest of her life is covered in photographs that always represent her as a professional cook. She uh, sort of converted her training to be a housemaid and a house cook to a landowning family into the profession of a cook in various institutional settings and uh, supported her two children who then sort of established their own lives in the city. Um, the third woman, the one who um, basically immigrated into the town with her family, this is the family. Uh, we have, as I said, no pictures of, no formal portraits. The earliest pictures we get are from a camera of a neighbor who was, um, who came back from the Sinai, um, having served in the UN troops, peacekeeping corps, um, and there um, sort of earned enough money to get himself a camera and to get a high quality suitcase that the children in the neighborhood all used when they moved away to various cities and uh, took their belongings with them to college. And um, we get his um, pictures of the family and various other neighbors. But um, this is one of the sons of Stana. Um, he clearly had a very different idea about how photography works. So we get sort of portraits of this kind of him, um, where as her daughter only has pictures like this. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, I wanted to show you um, some other, oh, I think I lost them. Sorry, I had other photographs in which the children of these people are uh, very much a part of the new uh, approach to photography and um, sort of the modernist ideas about film and television um, and that we have a lot of family um, archives um, that preserve the lives of their mothers um, as a part of their um, sort of modernization and new and easy access um, to media and to film. Um, so that's all I have for you for today. Thank you very much. Great. That was such an interesting Thank presentation. You. So I'm excited to talk more after I give a little spiel on peasant epistemologies and sort of like a different angle on the question of peasant epistemologies. So um, my presentation is titled Peasant Epistemologies and Folklore in the Yugoslav Region, again, meaning the general territory that socialist Yugoslavia used to occupy. Um, and I'm excited today to talk about something that's really been at the heart of my research for the past five, six years. Um, and that's the question of how we should understand ideas about superstition versus reason through an epistemological lens. So specifically, I'm interested in how and why peasants are so commonly represented as being backward and superstitious and stubborn and 
uh, resistant to change and all of these sort of stereotypes. Um, my work looks at this question really broadly and from like the late 19th century to the present, but today I just wanna focus on two specific case studies and to unpack how superstition functions as a form of epistemic violence. So I'm gonna talk first a little about my ethnographic research with incantation-based healers in villages in Serbia and Macedonia. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, self-taught peasant artists during the period between the two world wars. And throughout the talk, I'm gonna be also in conversation with some decolonial scholars and indigenous studies scholars to think about a possible methodology and agenda for uh, future research on peasant ways of knowing. So to start off with, Peasants and colonized people have a long shared history, which a lot of that history seems to be starting to be forgotten about these connections in sort of the shadow of Cold War amnesia. So some have proclaimed that the peasant issue is sort of dead, that peasants aren't a problem anymore, we don't really need to think about peasants um, in 2021. But it does remain the case that over half of the world's population are still considered to be peasants and that they make, peasants make up 79% of the world's total poor population while providing over 70% of the world's food. Um, rural and indigenous populations also overwhelmingly make up the front line of the climate crisis, face continual dispossession and exploitation. Um, and a favorite quote of mine from the late Marxist economist Samir Amin is that the global north has solved its agrarian question by creating a gigantic agrarian question in the peripheries, which it cannot solve but through the genocide of half of humankind. So I'm interested in the subject position of the peasant on both an economic and an epistemological basis. In economic terms, the peasant is a small agricultural producer who's Agricultural activities are at least partly devoted to satisfying subsistence needs um, and whose work is not entirely encompassed by the wage. As a producer of knowledge, the peasant is largely mediated through the discipline of folklore, where you see peasants sort of useful knowledge, kind of in a capitalist context, their useful knowledge is classified as vernacular knowledge, things like ethnobotany, um, which is drawn upon by like pharmaceutical companies and things like that. While their useless, in quotes, knowledge is classified as largely superstition. So things like ritual and magic, um, things like that. And while the transformation of the peasantry as an economic class has really been studied at length, their economic trajectory tends to really be privileged above the concurrent epistemological transformation that takes place. Um, I trace denigrating discourses surrounding vernacular knowledge and folk knowledge to Eurocentric evolutionary models of civilization that were constructed to justify global colonial expansion. For example, in early colonial documents during the Spanish conquest of the Americas, we see colonizers using the temporal discourse of the primitive and scare quotes to justify the kidnapping and enslavement of African people and the genocide of indigenous people. And in 1867, Victorian anthropologist Edward Tyler made the link between colonialism and folklore explicit when he theorized that European vernacular practices were leftovers from Europe's quote unquote savage past, which had fully active counterparts in the ethnographic present of non-Europeans. So, Tyler was seeking to purify essentially European culture from um, these folk elements or vernacular elements or superstitious elements. And Johannes Fabian has talked about this temporal distancing strategy as the denial of coevalness, which is a central feature of colonial anthropology. And by placing the peasant and the colonized subject and the indigenous subject all in conversation, the intent isn't to make these subject positions commensurable. Rather, 
I'm trying to demonstrate how shared logics of evolutionism have been deployed across these contexts and how these shared logics have been militantly resisted through the analytic frames of anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, and anti-capitalism. So this isn't a relationship of analogy, but rather a network of experiences that um, connect in intellectually provocative and generative ways. So up until this point, the link between the folklorization of Balkan peasants and colonial epistemology has not been explicitly theorized, which when I started working on this, I found pretty striking because commodified versions of Balkan folklore have achieved a pretty esteemed place internationally, um, dating back at least to the early 19th century when um, oral narratives, folklore oral narratives were published by prominent authors and intellectuals throughout Europe and became actually very popular amongst not only scholars, but also European intelligentsia and the bourgeoisie more broadly. And this, the popularity of Balkan folklore abides by the logic of what Richard Bauman and Charles Briggs have called folklore's invention of the great divide, which goes back to uh, Herder's theorization of folk in terms of romantic nationalism. So the Great Divide designates this insurmountable epistemological border, which separates the folk subject from the modern subject, um, where the modern subject is able to cross over this bridge, but the folk subject, once they leave the village, um, they can never regain that uh, worldview, the village worldview. That's basically the idea that was behind a lot of these folklorists work. And at the same time that this was happening, people were being encouraged to consume um, folklore in text form, like to read about folklore, to read about peasants, to see images of their national dress, things like that. But at the same time, the rural Balkans were also known as somewhere to like be avoided by all means. So there was actually no desire to go to those places except in your mind. Um, so how does this affect the lives of actual people who live in villages and who are peasants? Um, one ongoing problem, as I mentioned at the beginning, one ongoing problem in my work is to recognize where belief and superstition intersect with peasant knowledge and what that relationship is like. So since 2015, I've been doing ethnographic work um, in rural Serbia and Macedonia with healers who use incantations primarily as well as um, rituals and herbal medicines to heal people. Um, and these healing practices have been studied as folklore, but their political significance really has not been um, examine very much. So I've been interested in tying the experience that I have and the observations that I have and the interviews that I've done with healers with um, primarily Sylvia Federici's work um, on witches and women healers. So the figure of the woman healer and the figure of the witch have these intimately intertwined and sometimes indistinguishable histories. I locate the, the Bayanye healer or the Vrachanye healer um, in this middle zone between these two categories where her plant medicines really typify the healer and the incantations and rituals really typify the witch. Um, and in Caliban and the Witch, Sylvia Federici has sought to explain the logic behind this progressive disqualification of the knowledge of traditional healers and witches in Europe, Western and a little bit of Central Europe primarily rather than Eastern Europe um, since the early modern period. So Federici's foremost conclusion is that the dispossession of women healers under the guise of the witch trials or the witch craze constitutes a major example of primitive accumulation during the transition to capitalism. And that the plundering of the natural world and the violent exploitation of workers is fundamentally irreconcilable with the healer's more animistic worldview. 
Um, as a result, Federici argues that the conflict between these two worldviews resulted in the violent campaigns waged against women known as the witch craze, which she argues also informed the genocidal violence committed against indigenous people and enslaved African people during the conquest of the Americas. And this parallel is really what interests me, the sort of feedback loop that's happening uh, within Europe towards women healers and in the Americas towards um, enslaved African people and indigenous people, where all of these groups are having claims of superstition and primitivity lodged against them. In the Yugoslav region, witch trials formally began in Croatia in 1360, and these witch hunts were known for being particularly brutal. Women were accused, women were regularly tortured and burnt at the stake. Uh, and in 1609, Article 10 of the Croatian Assembly. Uh, quote, empowered all citizens of Croatia to search for witches and to hand them over for punishment, end quote. Those accused of witchcraft were often charged with making pacts with the devil, provoking weather events, causing sickness and death in human beings and in animals, and magically stealing milk from other people's cows. Uh, a woman could even be accused of witchcraft for cursing at thieves who stole from her if they later became ill. On the other side, this is in the Habsburg Empire at this point, on the other side of the imperial boundary, the Ottoman Balkans did not participate in this witch craze and perhaps because of this, we don't know, the practice of Bayanier remains or incantation-based healing remains somewhat more common in rural villages in the region today. Though witchcraft, divination, herbalism and associated healing practices still did come to be invalidated as superstition and treated as curiosities by folklorists in universities and museums. So my argument is that the normalization of superstition as a descriptor of magical practice denies epistemic sovereignty to those people who have practiced these forms of healing and divination for centuries. Federici argues that women healers were targeted for eradication because the irras irrationality of magical practice conflicted with the rationality of wage labor. Having close non-extractive relations to natural elements, access to power that could not be acquired by will or force, and the ability to be in multiple places and times at once all interfere with processes of primitive accumulation and the rationalization of the work process. Um, okay, and then, so this is, that was the part on healing. And now I wanna connect that to my work on self-taught peasant artists. Um, because due to my interest in the relationship of epistemic violence to anti-capitalist projects, I've also studied um, these collaborations that were happening between the two world wars between academically trained artists and peasant artists. And during which time they were seeking to develop a consciously revolutionary anti-colonial and uh, communist cultural agenda. So one particular group that I look at is Zemia, which is known as the Earth Group. They facilitated a well-known collaboration with the Hlebine School of Peasant Artists. And one of Zemia's leaders, Christo Hegedusic, led this initiative. And you can see in his writings from the 1930s that he argues that the aesthetics of the peasantry um, are the best means of communicating with the masses and creating a collective art. So he saw folk art really as facilitating a direct line of communication from the artist to the people, which explains the political potential of peasant aesthetics. Um, but there's this nagging intellectual problem with this collaboration, which is that at the same time that Hegedushich is talking positively about the formal characteristics of peasant art, he also is cautioning that a peasant artist who lacks class consciousness can be assumed to be, quote, a peasant poisoned by mysticism, end quote, and someone who believes in magic. And Hegedushich sees peasant mysticism as a reactionary force, which definite, and he definitively proclaims that this magical perspective in art will not contribute to progress nor anything useful for the peasant's class struggle. 
this is problematic because magic and peasant mysticism, in quotes, are not ancillary to the peasants' worldview. So I've been looking at interviews with Ivan Generalic, who is one of Hegedushic's oldest um, peasant collaborators. And he talks about the magical aspects of the village as being integral to the peasant worldview. Talking about one of his paintings called The Barn in Flames, he says, quote, around here they say that if a cock flies up on a roof and crows, there is going to be a fire. It's a belief that many people in these parts still heed today. I like to take these old folk sayings as a starting point for my pictures. It's a simple way of going back to my origins to what people consider true and important. And I really am focusing on those last few words, what people consider true and important. Um, this claim to truth, I think is important. And then in another painting of his called The Witch, when he's talking about this painting, he says, quote, when I was a child, they often told me stories about witches as happens or happened, I suppose, in any village. They were frightening stories because people know that witches can do harm whenever they like and can make anyone who bothers them sick. Sometimes they make the cows lose their milk and call up lightning and hailstorms to destroy the crops. Again, I'm interested in um, how he uses the word know or knowledge to know that know something about witches, to know something about um, these folk sayings. And knowing that trajectory of the disqualification of peasant knowledge and its relationship to the epistemic disenfranchisement of indigenous people through colonization. I am really critical of Hegedusic's dismissal of peasant mysticism. And this isn't something specific to Hegedusic, but actually is quite pervasive in the work of 20th century anti-colonial and anti-capitalist thinkers, including Franz Fanon, who talks about uh, ritual and magic as being diversions of the colonized subject's energy, um, saying that the belief in these non-human beings causes colonized subjects to feel like they don't have to fight the colonizers anymore because these mythical structures are more terrifying. Um, and so, so the supernatural magic and superstition are understood as getting in the way of revolutionary practice. But Within this radical theory of decolonization, I'm seeing in this disavowal of belief and ritual, some similarities to Edward Tyler, the Victorian anthropologist and his desire to purify European culture from practices like spiritualism and astrology, which he saw as anti-rational and anti-capitalist. Um, so if decolonization sets out to change the order of the world, and as Fanon says, if the peasant is the truth in their very being, then the presence of this Victorian idea of superstition is threatening to undermine this radical project. And just to sort of wrap things up, one area that I've been really drawn to, partly because I've been trained by an indigenous studies scholar, but um, I have found a lot of resonance in the work of indigenous studies scholars when it comes to challenging normative approaches to um, ritual and its relationship to ways of knowing. So over the last like 15 years, there has been the ontological turn taking place in indigenous studies and a lot of which is basically transforming the issue of how to recognize indigenous knowledge as knowledge rather than calling it just belief or that this is about spirituality rather than um, real relationships between people and other people, maybe humans other than human persons. Um, an example recently is that um, in New Zealand, several rivers and mountains have been recognized as people having their same rights as people, as well as the Vilcabamba River in Ecuador. Those are just some brief examples. Um, I mostly have been drawing on the work of Diné scholar Glenn Coulthard and the Anishinaabe scholar Leanne Edasamosake Simpson, who 
have made a really important contribution to recognizing indigenous cultural practices as not being about raising morale or raising sort of political consciousness just being this sort of like cultural add-on, but rather that these cultural practices, indigenous cultural practices prefigure the decolonial future and that they're permanent features of decolonial political projects themselves, essentially modeling that Simpson writes that how we live, how we organize, how we engage in the world, the process not only frames the outcome, it is the transformation. Um, so this process of cultural reclamation is revolutionary, not because it's igniting consciousness, but because it's actualizing ways of being, knowing and relating that defy the violence of colonialism. And so in this sort of line of thinking, I'm interested in how we can reconceptualize incantation-based practices, other rituals that happen in the village, other sorts of knowledge which are not validated inside of the university um and yeah i think i think that i will end there okay thank you so much um dr jack jen kristen and noako rickley in uh, for this interesting and insightful presentation and um, now i want to open the webinar for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, you can raise your virtual hands and uh, as well you can write uh, on the chat box so I can read them. Okay, let's wait for a second. I'm not sure if I can see all like uh, Yes, I think now. Yes, Dr. Altenai, yes. Hi, thank you very much for your great talks. It was a pleasure to listen to you. I am wondering what decolonial politics looked like in the lands, land that's former Yugoslavia and the broader Balkans, because they also have certain serious shortcomings. They are sometimes landing themselves too easily to certain articulations of liberal politics in the Turkish context. What is happening there uh, and in relation to peasants? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's definitely a sticky problem um, because some countries, maybe Turkey is one, I know Hungary is definitely one that is has sort of like repackaged the decolonial as a frame for far right nationalism. Um, I'm not seeing like in the village, like decolonization is really not a pressing like idea at this point. Um, and I'm not even suggesting that we should be thinking about this as like a decolonization process, but rather like kind of what sorts of ways of knowing are brought up when we think about decolon decolonizing knowledge and what links there actually are even inside of Europe of these sorts of knowledges that have been displaced through this global process. Um, certainly, like, as I said, and I could go into more like the question of indigeneity is certainly misplaced and should not, does not have any actual there's no there there if you're talking about indigeneity in the context of former Yugoslavia um because it really only makes sense in a settler colonial context where you have um this dualism but yeah most of the work that's being done in villages I mean I've seen some really interesting feminist projects that would be I think Olivera kind of related to what you're talking about of like story circles with young women talking about their life experiences. Um, very little is like, I don't really see much focused on culture or working with these healers. The only other people who are out there with me are folklorists who are trying to collect their stories and their, um, to write down their incantations and things like that. I'm not sure if that answers sort of what you're asking. 
I, I would add that I think it's important to um, sort of keep an eye out on uh, the land um, reform and land property uh, politics. Uh, and in that sense, um, a lot of the um, politics that has been associated with uh, the term decolonial um, is also associated with socialism and everything in the aftermath of the disintegration of socialist Yugoslavia is trying to pretend that it's sort of an, uh, um, a reversal of the somehow misguided politics of um, decolonizing or affiliating and associating um, and uh, solidarity with the post-colonial or anti-colonial um, politics across the globe. So uh, I think at this point, the um, politics of decolonization are um, in a way on hold uh, because they're impossible to see um, in the sort of land grab that's currently going on. And the effort to uh, join the European Union, which produces all kinds of policy changes um, and um, uh, vitalizes uh, many political actors who are uh, intricately connected to uh, the government uh, structures that go back uh, to um, the post or to the war years um, and the um, unclear property relations and ideas about whose the land is, what the peasants are doing for the anti-fascist or socialist uh, modernization, um, that um, it's very, if not impossible, it's very difficult to talk about decolonizing anything in, in this part of former Yugoslavia. Yeah, and also just you made me what you made me think about was that it's actually was much more like in the interwar period that was like the height of decolonial thought in the village like people were really explicitly theorizing, especially in Croatia like what did Habsburg occupation for like all this time what effect was it having culturally and also on property relations and um lots of like that that was explicit in the writing from that time that it's anti-colonial so we're somehow like now even not to the point of the interwar period today there's there's very interesting um anthropological work uh by um a bosnian woman who um i think has a uh, a contingent job at the University of Chicago. Her name is Larissa Yasharovic. Um, she wrote a book about the sort of economy of healing and gift um, in post-war, post-socialist Bosnia. Um, and there sort of talks about what the possibilities of imagining um, the human relations as an effect of economic relations, what pos possibilities exist in a society that's almost entirely consumed um, by um, underground economies, um, by post-war trauma, by sort of complete uncertainty of any kind of future, um, that the marginalization of everything um, kind of makes self-colonization the order of the day, that there's um, hardly anything one can lean on um, to critique uh, one's position. One can mostly describe it. Um, so it's kind of important to keep uh, a, a, an eye on the context of um, what the sort of progressive position would be. Uh, thank you for these wonderful presentations. I was thinking about both of my grandmothers, actually, who were peasants and who had to feed the family in the absence of the, their husbands, actually. So this was for me like a very effective presentation. And um, I was thinking about Christina's presentation in the context of superstition. And um, you said like 
the indigenous studies right now trying to uh, move, try, you know, um, understand indigenous knowledge as knowledge, like there is a tendency to recognize indigenous knowledge as a knowledge, like a category in uh, research. But I was thinking about why not doing the vice versa? Why not uncovering the scientific knowledge and its biased perspectives and create, you know, a, um, creating a field that we cannot, we can claim, stere you know, superstition as not a stereotype, but as a form of knowledge, another form of, or maybe uh, a kind of like um, more performative approach to. Uh, knowledge. So I was thinking about these issues, the boundaries between superstition, beliefs, and knowledge creation, knowledge production. So can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah, I think that that's really a key question here with, if I'm understanding you correctly, is it is part of what you're asking um, whether superstition itself can sort of be reclaimed as a different mode of knowing. Yeah, I think, I mean, superstition has a lot of baggage, which is my only, is, is part of the contentious relationship that I have to it. I do, when I see the word superstition now, it, it's sort of like, hmm, let me go look closer at that. So I do think that it kind of does function as a sort of arrow of this is a different form of knowledge over here because otherwise probably the term wouldn't be used. Um, and I think that you're right that critiquing and interrogating dominant ways of knowing is necessary in order to create a dialogue between these different systems of knowledge and usually that dialogue has only gone in one direction. So it's been like, what can we find from superstitious practices that we could make money off of or that we could, um, you know, use in medical treatments or something like that. But I'm really still struggling with sort of what to do with all of these practices within the category of superstition. I didn't even try to go into this um, area of inquiry, really. I just started working with healers and everyone started telling me like, oh, like you're gonna work with like these like superstitious grandmas. And there would even be people who I was working with on folklore issues, but they were only interested in talking about the songs and about music, when I told them I was interested in these incantation practices, they're like, you know, no, it's like giving us a bad rap. That's, we don't wanna be associated with this like kind of backwards thing. Um, and I'm not saying that like these healers have all of the answers or that everything that they're doing is, should be counted as knowledge. But I think that like you're saying, bringing belief and superstition and knowledge together like is a necessary process to start seeing like, okay, did we write these things off too easily? Like what, why would people still be practicing this stuff for all this time if they weren't effective or if they weren't based on their own knowledge? Yeah, I feel like this is a, a great question that crosses um, many contexts and historical periods. It's kind of um, made me think of um, the novel Frankenstein um, and sort of the discussion about the origins of modernity or the limits of belief in rational knowledge and knowing something as an individual, uh, transfer of knowledge or ideas about knowledge in a vacuum, um, and to what degree um, superstition or beliefs in um, things that aren't um, repeatable or are not replicable, um, that do not follow the principles of modern science, let's say, or inductive reasoning, um, that something about that is 
um, related very closely to the conditions of um, social interaction, of feelings of community, of um, some kind of um, circumstances under which um, knowledge about oneself, uh, about one body, um, about its relations to others um, and connections that um, exceed the rational, um, that um, it's a very loaded and politically significant uh, discussion. So I think um, it's worth, um, again, keeping an eye on how the, um, how certain kinds of knowledge get disqualified um, as superstition and um, what criteria are used to demonstrate that something is uh, modern, um, transparent, um, clearly available to everyone. I would like to uh, hear about uh, more of this uh, Cold War amnesia uh, specific to this area, actually. Can you give um, us more insight about that, about this concept? Yeah. Um, I think you can speak in a lot of different ways about Cold War amnesia, but my own specific perspective on it is coming from the move that has been made to talk about post-socialism in relationship to post-colonialism since like the 90s. It's become pretty popular to talk about these two ideas in conversation with one another and how this current position, peripheral position of the post-socialist subject um, is similar to the way that the post-colonial subject his voice is really not heard and not um, like there's been work by like Medina Tlastanova talk comparing sort of the post-socialist uh, marginalized position to the post-colonial condition. And I've been seeing in that discourse us real like forgetting that during all of socialism and the interwar period that these connections were already being made. There was already the connection between the socialist world and the decolonizing world. There was already like all of this exchange that was happening. They were not two discrete projects of decolonization and socialism. Um, someone just posted not that long ago, a picture of like Franz Fanon with some Yugoslav uh, journalists. And like there, there was a lot of these like networks already in place. And so from my perspective, some of the post-Cold post, uh, post War amnesia is this trying to like reinvent the wheel as though this is not like a continuation or even maybe like a regression from the sort of decolonial, anti-colonial, socialist, communist conversations that were happening throughout the 20th century. And a, a lot of the amnesia has been imposed by the uh, sort of umbrella narrative about the triumph of capitalism and the complete defeat of state socialism as a possibility. Um, and if you look a little bit more closely at what the socialism stood for, uh, both historically and in sort of so social practice, um, a lot of it had to do with sort of the uh, preservation of the anti-fascist, um, anti-imperialist legacies um, in the education system in relating to other nations. Um, Yugoslav Socialist Yugoslavia was one of the founders of the non-aligned movement. Um, all of that, including, as I was saying, um, interventions in the lives of women or ideas about where the limits of equality are and what is natural and what is unnatural and what can be changed. Um, all of that is sort of actively being reversed um, as we're supposed to enter liberal democracy and uh, understand how it is irreconcilable with certain kinds of socialist thinking um, that um, a lot of the legacy um, that was um, sort of putting us in touch with various um, 
anti-colonial tendencies around the world um, are now impossible to remember or hard to sort of connect to what's um, now going on that it's virtually impossible to say in public um, that there is something worth preserving about those years, that not everything um, was bad. So it's, it's a lot of um, sort of folding over of available historical narratives or explanations. Thank you so much. There is um, a question in the chat box. Uh, it's a bit long. I will read it. Uh, it's from uh, Halide Veliolu. And hi, thank you very much for wonderful and inspiring presentations. I have done an ethnography of daily life in Sarajevo. One of my observations that I could not draw on was the Bosnians particular joy of mountains, rivers and forests. Urban, uh, urbanites uh, have different modalities of relating to the nature. Nevertheless, it is not totally extrinsic uh, to the indigenous way of knowing. Probably we need to think more in terms of articulation rather than oppositions. I wonder what would you say? Thank you. Thank you. I think we should listen to Christina in this, um, in the sense that um, something about the figure of a peasant in former Yugoslavia um, is very um, akin to uh, a figure of um, a person untouched by modernity. Um, and a lot of the um, migrations and uh, social change that were occasioned by the uh, efforts to modernize the country, which was predominantly uh, populated by peasantry, um, involved moving a bunch of people to cities, giving them education and jobs, uh, sort of creating a whole new middle class, uh, which didn't necessarily know how to enjoy urban life. Um, and so the return to uh, mountains and rivers and forests um, that has to do with um, even present day life um, also returned to uh, sort of native villages, um, keeping a house where the old parents were. Uh, that is a very common experience all through uh, for Yugoslavia. And um, it's also the, the kind of um, narrative of modernization that I guess is familiar to um, other societies that modernized um, by um, grabbing land from people um, who were working it, um, but earlier. So if you look at romantic poetry in English uh, from the turn of the 19th century, you'll see narratives about this and the possibility of um, sort of reconciling oneself or losing one's children to the city and to the modern life. Um, that nature becomes a thing because um, now there's something to um, oppose it to. Um, so I, I think, um, I'm not sure what the findings were in Sarajevo, uh, but there's definitely um, an interesting um, sort of context to look at the lives of villages and the lives in the mountains as opposed to the life in the city there. Um, if you remember that the city was under siege during the war, um, it was under siege by the Serbian forces um, and the Serbian enclave of the city um, is basically a, a rural um, town um, on the hills, uh, whereas the city proper is in a valley. Um, the urbanity of the valley um, has routinely been opposed to the sort of um, um, crudeness um, and um, sort of violence and aggression um, of uh, the attacks on the city. Uh, and so it's, it's a very interesting history of um, sort of conflicting feelings about um, 
appreciation of city life, appreciation of nature, um, and appreciation of nature is something that's sort of in indigenous to you, as opposed to something that you have to run to because um, you've run out of space or you've run out of joys and pleasures. Um, so that, that would be my take on it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's one, one like um, distinction I think that I see with um, looking at sort of like romantic Ver romanticism and how nature appears in romanticism versus how nature appears even today um, with people who are not too far removed from like their own histories and probably peasant roots is that the natural features are usually quite specific and even identities are not we have national identities, but also like regional identities are so important still that fall outside of the nation. And uh, like I work in Eastern Serbia a lot with Vlach communities and they like, they're very specific about like, you know, it's not like just trees or it's not just mountains, it's this particular tree and this is what happened around this tree or it's this particular mountain and here's the history of um, why these mountains are so important or like in Montenegro of course like the mountains are spoken about a lot as you know the refuge from Ottoman uh, invasion and the place where people were able to stay safe when with their families for long periods of time so I think that this sort of like specific the relationship to a specific landscape and a specific history that's inside of that landscape is important in sort of distinguishing maybe what like um, a romanticism might be, which is sort of this yearning for an abstract nature often versus like, no, this is, these are real events and histories that are tied to these certain natural features. Thank you very much. In line of both uh, of your uh, comments, I would like to add something specific. I guess uh, in Bosnia, as Olivera just pointed out, uh, of course, the, they were surrounded by Serbian forces, paramilitary forces from the mountains, and these mountains have specific significance after the war. But also, all these people have uh, had been relying on some natural sources to their little yards, gardens, for their survival. So I guess survival itself, the knowledge of survival uh, for citizens, for urbanites also, uh, kind of blurred the boundaries of indigeneity and urbanite modality of living. So I guess one of one one um, I have to say uh, one more factor: the knowledge of survival. It is it still stays with them. So I guess we we need to be a little bit how to say we need to remember that the region is really specific, and all of them knows deep in heart that uh, the day of judgment may come, uh, terrible events might happen and they might uh, be dependent on their little yards or gardens or mountains or whatever. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think you're completely right about that. Yeah, thank you. I wondered if I could ask Oliveira a question. Sure. <laughs> um, I don't know how, I don't know what the timeline is and how much time we have, but um, I was just curious because you were talking about the sort of contrast between socialist and post-socialist um, gender regimes. And I was wondering what, like, were single mothers included or to what extent were they included in the like explicit sort of feminist movement in Yugoslavia and their organizing? Um, which I guess was like later, like in the 70s and stuff. But yeah, I was just wondering if they were part of that. Um, I, I can't say what uh, part of any feminist movement they were or what kinds of uh, concern they were to whoever thought of themselves as feminist at the time. But they were uh, not just uh, children of single parents or widows, but um, 
children born out of wedlock uh, were legally equal. There was no distinction made um, since I think the 1950s uh, between the rights and privileges of children born out of wedlock and um, children born, born to married women. Um, and this was one of the sort of groundbreaking um, policies um, that especially to women who um, in a way fled to cities uh, to anonymity um, could um, create a life for themselves and um, had access to any number of privileges that uh, women who uh, lived more conventional lives um, could have. That it, it didn't necessarily register in the formal successes of the child, whether the mother had been by herself or not. Now, whether um, on the social end of things, um, whether that was a problem um, for the woman herself um, is, a, I think, a completely different issue. Um, that um, the survival was possible, but not necessarily pleasant. Um, and that um, I think cities were um, the refuges for um, many women who in a smaller uh, place would have had a much different uh, marginalized life. In, I think in the, in the villages, it's interesting uh, for uh, the women of the generation that I was discussing and their children, that um, being a war widow was so common that there were plenty of um, women who were single mothers, even among the migrant populations, the people who were moved into the town in the late 40s. Um, even those women, sometimes with six and seven and eight children, um, would sort of continue to be um, just the, the sole guardian of all those kids. Um, and I think the interesting politics there begin at um, what I was mentioning with one of the women I discussed, um, whether those women uh, decide to remarry and um, address some of their economic problems that way or emotional and psychological ones, or they decide to move um, to a more modern, urban, anonymous place where um, the uh, possibilities of economic sustenance and um, ideas about what their lives are for and what can what they can achieve um, and how they can live um, would be very different. Thank you so much. I think I don't know. Yeah, I can't, I can't quite hear. I'm really sorry. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jokic and Christina. I think uh, we don't have any other questions, right? Um, yes, we don't have any other okay. questions. So, um, so I just wanted we... to say thank you, everyone, for showing up and for all the questions um, and for putting on such a fantastic program. Thank you very much yeah, for joining us.